Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we now have Jayesh Ishwamani, who is the Vice President and General Manager of, for Asia Pacific, the Middle East, and Africa at Imobi, which is a good portion of the world, actually. But prior to that, he was specifically focused on Japan and Asia Pacific, so he does know a great deal about this particular area. And he's particularly engaged with uh, user acquisition and monetization, I believe, which are two very key areas that come up a lot today. Obviously, these are areas that we really need to find workable solutions to, sustainable solutions to. Um, but we have a lot of experience, I suppose, working with very big companies in, in the mobile sector. So if you'd like to get started. Thanks, Matt, uh, for that introduction. Uh, so <clears throat> a quick introduction about Inmobi. So Inmobi is uh, the largest independent mobile ad network. We reach around 1 billion uh, you know, unique devices on our network. Uh, what, what has happened to us uh, in the last 12 to 18 months is something very interesting. We have transformed our company uh, into a new ad experience format company. So almost 60% of our revenues comes from new formats like native, interstitial, video, rewarded video, which you have been hearing uh, throughout the day. And at our scale, with the variety of ad formats that we have, we end up working with almost 70 to 80 percent of the, the largest players in the ecosystem, be it brands, be it gaming companies, be it e-commerce apps. Uh, so we have a lot of experience in, in mobile, both user acquisition and mobile and, and uh, monetization. Uh, so you've heard this before. I'll just uh, kind of uh, talk through the couple of most important trends. Uh, so if you look at the mobile gaming market today, it's very concentrated with the big gaming companies. The titles have not changed too much, uh, and, and, and kind of, it's kind of a, a virtuous cycle. So the more cash you have, the better the valuation, and hence you can do a lot more on marketing and user acquisition. And so there's a clear gap now between the large gaming companies and the smaller ones. And uh, when Mr. Mario enters the game, which, which is going to be very soon, it's only going to get bigger and bigger, right? So a uh, lot of apprehension about how this you know, gaming market is going to change. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, ad monetization has had a good run. So, you know, when I used to come to conferences like this, you know, 18, 20 months back, I used to, you know, murmur how much is the eCPM that you could get. I used to say, oh, maybe it is two dollars. But today, I think with the with the the kind of formats that we have, whether it is native, whether it is video, whether it is interstitial, uh, eCPMs have gone up eight to ten times. So that gives you the ability to monetize better. Uh, at the same time, there's a, there's a change in the perception of the large branding companies. So, so today, a Pepsi wants to reach to the gaming audience because they fit their target profile. So, so I think be, be, with, with the big data analytics that we have, uh, we are able to kind of position the audience to, to some of the largest brands in the world. And that gives uh, more CPMs. And we are able to layer it with different kinds of targeting, whether it is demographic, whether it is by the app affinity that we ha they have, which we call as apographic targeting, and so on and so forth. Um, and because there's a need for monetization is so high, even for gaming companies, the gaming companies have already created the formats for their in-app purchases. On that same format or on that same slot, you can run advertising as well. So from all those angles, actually, it's been a better year for ad monetization compared to uh, in-app purchases. So, so really, I think most gaming companies are at this stage where they have been sold the dream, and now they're wondering how to make money uh, without breaking their back, right? And so what I have tried to do is to kind of see how can you bring monetization to the core of how you bring, how you do game design, right? And I think mon monetization can be maximized by doing these four things. One, how do you start thinking uh, about the brain of the gamer, how you know how does the brain work? What are some of the neuro neurosciences behind how the brain makes a few decisions? And then once you have that, I mean, we talk a lot about you know I'm designing in-app purchases, but what you're actually trying to do is to make the user take a decision under certain constraints or under a simulated emotion. Like you you know you want he wants the next in-app purchase, he wants to raise more, he wants to defeat the opponent. So you're simulating that emotion. And then when you, you know, kind of get this transaction or this exchange right, is when you, you know, can create good in-app purchases or 
you can do monetization through ads through an happy exchange. And lastly, you have to respect the process because I think a lot of people think you know, the game design, the art, art behind it is more important than the science. But you know, it, it goes both ways. You need to match the two. You have to believe in that process for you to be able to maximize the monetization in your game. So I've used a few references. So the, the theory behind how the brain works has got more and more advanced in the last three to four years. So I would really encourage you to pick up any of these books uh, to kind of look at the neurosciences behind uh, how, how the brain actually takes a decision, uh, you know, what are some of the you know, common information processing that the brain does, right? So what I have done is then uh, looked at it from a gaming perspective, right? So when we talk about genres in gaming, right, we talk about or oh, this is an action RPG game, this is a you know, puzzle game. But be, behind that, there are a few core intelligences that you're appealing to. So when you look at an action racing game, you're basically appealing to the kinetic intelligence inside the brain. So that is more power hungry, right? So power becomes a core uh, you know, feature of that game. If you're looking at more fantasy RPG, what you're, what you're appealing towards is spatial intelligence. How do you design? your city, how do you design your, you know, uh, the various simulations that you're doing. And I think the, one of the previous speakers talked about map design in a game. And it's very different when you do the map design when you're doing an action-oriented game versus when you're doing an adventure or a fantasy RPG game. So when you take an important game decision like, you know, map design, it's probably better to ask yourself what is that core intelligence you're appealing to as uh, in, inside the mind of the gamer. Similarly, there are other intelligences which, which also the game uses, which is associative intelligence, which is usually used by you know, puzzles and adventure games. And then you know, there are a lot of logic-based games as well. So uh, it's important, you know, each, depending on the intelligence, you will have a different stress on some of your core game decisions. So for example, when you're talking about associative intelligence, which is and Puzzles and Dragons is a great uh, you know, example of that, where character development and time trade-offs become more important when you're trying to talk, when, when your core intelligence that you're appealing to is associative. So rather than thinking about the genre, if you start thinking about what is the core intelligence that you're appealing to, you might find your answers. Then once you start layering that with what is the core emotional appeal of the game, right? And even if you take one genre like you know, action RPG, uh, every game has a slightly different persona. And this is when you can start developing the persona of the game uh, in terms of you know, what's its emotional appeal. And, and that helps you design not just the game, but also the marketing behind that game. Right? Once you start launching it, what is the marketing principles that you will use to promote it? Right? And I think Clash of Clans is a great example of how they have kind of integrated uh, game design and the marketing aspects by focusing on a few core emotional drivers uh, in, in their marketing efforts as well, right? So this is how you kind of come closer to how the brain starts thinking. Uh, then once a game, you know, once a gamer starts playing the game, there are a few core emotions that he goes through. The starting point of that is curiosity. So especially in an adventure game or an you know, uh, puzzle, you know, RPG game, how the game appeals to him, how does he get involved, you know, what are the different level movements, has to kind of attract his curiosity levels, right? Um, similarly, when after, the, you know, after he becomes curious about the game, it's about how much time will he invest to really master that game. And that is where, you know, how much visibility you provide on various control levers, various, you know, uh, kind of gameplay mechanics available becomes very important because especially resource-based games need to make that, make, need to help the gamer make that choice in their mind, right? So that, that creates comfort around, yes, I will invest time in this game. And then once you start playing the game, he becomes more ambitious, he wants to cross more levels, and that is where leaderboards, notifications, all of this becomes a very important instrument of how you kind of stimulate the user to kind of playing more and more, uh, or you know, 
tracking more levels, buying more in-app purchases, and so on. And the last part is about uh, impatience, because people do get impatient when they don't cross that level. You need to design your rescue movements. You need to design a lot of things to kind of protect the user from switching off, right? And so this is that emotional journey uh, that the gamer goes through. And the, the ones on the right are the ones where you can influence that and keep him more engaged with your game. Then as you go towards more complex pieces of monetization, uh, there are a few tricks, or there are ways to trick the brain, right? And this has been proved by a lot of research. So some of the common uh, tricks available are this. So one is the brain uses a few shortcuts. So you know, if you take an example, if I show you four cards, which the first three cards, you have to do some multiplication, and you go through it one by one. By the time you reach the fourth card, you are not multiplying. You are actually guessing. So the brain starts to guess based on the first three cards, and it actually doesn't perform that multiplication. So that is something which you can use uh, you know, to, to your advantage. And I'll explain how you can do that. Similarly, anchoring. So this is very common in retail. Like you, they price it at you know, 1.99 instead of $2, because that creates an anchor. So similarly, when you have multiple levels and you have, when you're designing your currency, it's important to kind of use this to see how much value trade-offs does the, the, the user uh, make, right? Does he, so you want him to go from A to B in $1, but then B to C is he has to spend a lot more, right? So that is where anchoring comes in. Uh, there's always a relative bias. So you will buy a book because your friend has bought it or it is related to that you know, genre that you're buying. Amazon is a great example of how they have exploited relative bias. And the last is anybody who has bought a house in a, in a, in a property bubble knows about 0.4. Uh, if you are making a loss on your house, you're more reluctant to sell it because even though you know it is loss making, you hold on to your losses. So this becomes more important when you design rescue movements and, and so on. So if you just take these kind of uh, things which are available uh, as shortcuts, uh, so when you, when you start thinking about how the brain processes information, it's important on how you lay out your in-app purchases. So there are the more successful games which monetize well uh, focus a lot on how you lay it out, right? how intuitive it is, so that you can be part of the way uh, you know, information is being processed by the brain when he's playing the game. Uh, similarly, anchoring, as I mentioned, this is how you determine your ticket size, the size of your store, how much complexity you create, what is the acceptable power gap between a normal user and a power user. All of this is based on the principle of anchoring. Like, what is, you know, what is two dollars worth to one gamer versus, you know, another gamer? Uh, leaderboards, I mentioned, that's a great way of creating relative bias, and I think uh, the more successful monetizing games make leaderboards really attractive. Like, you know, the, the call to action from a leaderboard is very, very clear. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can use rescue moments in a, uh, because that's the time when you have basic, the gamer at your you know, control to, to kind of you know, navigate him to the next best possible move, right? And the same goes for any time-based rewards, how, how, what's, how do you design the stress levels within a game, and, and so on and so forth. So if you put it all together, uh, if you take these two examples, one is Candy Crush and the other one is a Mubage game, uh, they have used the principles of all these uh, techniques that I mentioned quite well. So you know, the intelligence is logical. There's a lot of emotional comfort around if you pay for the in-app purchase, what happens to you, and there's a simulation that they have created uh, there's an anchoring saying, you know, this gives you 3x, and then the next levels will give you 5x. So all that is already done. Uh, the same goes for a game which is more associative. It's more adventure-seeking. So that's why they have kind of designed the two options. One is the carrot and the, the other one. Uh, and so it creates that sustained anchoring. But if you look at the third one, you will find that this doesn't monetize that well because they have used only one of the principles that I mentioned, which is just giving comfort that these are the various levels possible in the game. But it doesn't simulate any other action, because a lot of the other information pieces are missing. And, and, and people can't correlate what will happen uh, when they do uh, take a few actions. Right? So you can use this you know, set of uh, you know, principles to design 
uh, any core gaming uh, problem, right? So either, uh, and I've just used this to show the, the one most important thing, which is the user's part to first purchase. But you can use this to create progress gates. You can create it for rescue movements. All the critical aspects of game design, you can use the same principles. Um, and I just have more examples of it. So curiosity, uh, instead of just showing uh, what levels are available, if you can construct it in this manner, and this is another example I like where on, on the, uh, what is there below, it really shows the different skill levels of that character. And it is kind of well hidden, but at the same time quite intuitive. So that generates uh, the curiosity value much better than, you know, uh, and it creates the ability for the user to sample it. Uh, the same goes for ambition. Different kinds of leaderboards create different kinds of, uh, you know, social impact. So, you know, this is where, you know, it's very clear, very, you know, more direct. This works well in action-based games. Uh, you know, this is where you you want to kind of show what has happen, uh, happened, but also show what is possible. So that gives you an ability to say, if you buy the following currency, you might be, you know, you can you can top up or you can, you know, use that for pay to play. Uh, this is more for a different kind of genre, which is more social. So it it kind of has a different kind of leaderboard. So ambition levels versus leaderboard is a, is a good way to see. Uh, how to maximize monetization. And the more scenarios you can create around the leaderboard, the better the monetization gets. Uh, similarly, rescue movements, uh, save me is a more direct way. And then there's a daily deal, which is kind of simulating saying, okay, you know, make a conscious choice that you need to be saved and take a decision to either watch a, uh, you know, a video or something else or pay, you know, or pay something. So, you can use these same principles uh, because what you're doing is following the emotional journey of the gamer and using certain shortcuts that the brain typically uses. In, and, and you have these things at your arsenal to kind of mix and match, right? Uh, the next point is that people think that, you know, monetization mechanics for gameplay for in-app purchases is different from ad monetization. But what we believe is that it's probably the same emotional journey so if you look at it, uh, people are exploring certain aspects of your game that has a certain curiosity. Uh, similarly, you know, while achieving, there's an ambition level. So instead of a leaderboard, you could show an ad. Uh, similarly, when you disengage, that's when you have the best chance to show a rewarded video ad. And I think a lot of people have spoken about it in this conference. I will not get there. But really, it's about the same emotional journey, right? And every user goes through a certain emotional journey when he's playing a game, uh, depending on levels, depending on you know where he's stuck at, whether he's able to crack that or whatever, right? And so you can use that same principles which work for in-app purchases for ad monetization as well, right? And these are some of the exa examples, right? Where in, when the gamer is trying to explore various things available, maybe he's checking out what are the different card battles, what are the different uh, you know, sources of power, you can also show a native interstitial, which is in line with the look and feel of the game, right? So it captures that same exploratory, curiosity-inducing emotion, which you are trying to capture when you're trying to do in-app purchases as well, right? So static interstitials or native interstitials work very well when during that same exploring function, right? Similarly, when you go towards achievement, the same leaderboard can be used in multiple ways where uh, as I said, if you want to top up or if you want to show a scenario, what could happen when they purchase a few in-app, uh, you know, in-app items, you could use that to show, uh, you know, either brand video ads or you could show, you know, the possibilities through video ads, right? And usually, most game publishers uh, use this slot for a in-house ad, right? And you will see a video of either uh, another of the game publisher's title. Or you know it might be something to show you know uh, some game mechanics which you have not explored, but that same slot is available for you to show a video ad from a brand or from you know another gaming company. Uh, so you can use that achievement function quite well. Uh, similarly, disengagement. Uh, you know people have spoken about it. That's the best way, best time to show a rewarded video ad. People are about to switch out. They need a save me moment. Uh, great place to interject and show a rewarded video ad completely in line with the user experience completely uh, and all three players are happy the gamer is happy the brand, you know the advertiser is happy and the 
uh, you know, publisher is also happy. So, uh, so the same logic of what you know, the emotional journey can be captured both for an app as well as for ads. I think for in-app, it's more complex, and there are more variables at play. But once you have designed those variables, the slots are available for you to show ads as well. So uh, I mean, this is uh, you know, what, what we think at Enmobi, and this, um, you, know, um, you, know, you, can, you can kind of read up on some of these other brain-based techniques. Uh, what we also believe is the yin and yang of monetization. So I think a lot of indie developers, a lot of developers we meet focus are too much on the game design, focus too much on, you know, so there is obviously uh, the right way to create in-app purchases and create the game economy and, and so on, and that gives you money as a result. But I feel there is uh, another type of game, right, which is basically how you do the monetization. And you will find that a lot of sophisticated gaming companies uh, are running this almost like how you would trade in the financial markets, right? I mean, uh, it's interesting that some of the people who do user acquisition in Supercell are ex-investment bankers. So the whole idea of you know using metrics, what is the ROI of every user that you acquire through different ad networks? All of that has a very predictable sen sen you know predictable set of metrics. There's a science behind it, and don't shy away from it, right? I mean, I think a lot of game developers think that this is too complex. There are too many ways too many ad networks, but really, that's the game that you really want to play, because once you've seen you know, 100,000 users paying for your you know, game, you can take it to the next level. There is enough scale available, there is enough ad formats available to kind of you know, make your 100 into 1,000 uh, very easily by using you know, different techniques. Uh, and I think people tend to forget the last part, which is uh, the creative aspect. So, the reason I mentioned game personas and you know what's the persona of your game, uh, we have done a lot of campaigns where changing the creative based on you know different characters, different kinds of uh, you know s you know simulations or call to action really makes a big difference on how you can you know acquire users at what kind of CPI. And then once you can play this game, right? When I say play this game, about knowing what is the LTV of your user how much are you willing to spend on it. There's a lot more sophistication you can bring up in it by you know, even going after certain kinds of publishers where there's a, you know, there's, there's a high, there are high chance of higher LTV users or acquiring that inventory and so on and so forth. So, and most of the top uh, gaming companies today are doing some of these things along with TV advertising or billboard advertising to, to kind of look at it like an integrated marketing plan, right? And there are more metrics. So as, as somebody mentioned, uh, you know, LTV of the user from video ads is much better than you know, other kind of forms of ads. We have seen it on our network as well. More than 2x better LTV uh, from video ads. And uh, similarly from native, native ads, we've done native ads with Tango, Blackberry Messenger, and, and, and many other players, including Kakao Story in, in Korea. And these are some of the metrics we have seen better CTR, better uh, you know, uh, engagement, uh, more receptivity to the ad unit. So as I said, uh, it's been a great year for ad monetization. So you, using some of these ad units really uh, improves your you know, ECPMs. And uh, once you can layer video ads and targeting, we have also seen that the ECPM lift is, so if you take video ads, without targeting and video ads with any kind of targeting, which what we call as you know, app-based targeting, where we try to find out similar gaming users or similarity of users, you can see that the eCPM uplift is almost 1.8 times compared to you know, rewarded ad, I mean, sorry, video ads without targeting. So the whole targeting and audience sciences also starts making a difference when you, uh, when you uh, start to monetize with different ad, uh, with ad networks as well. So, Basically, this is uh, what I had to share. Uh, as, as you think about it, uh, it's like a yin and yang. There is a certain amount of time you have to invest in your game design using certain techniques to, to make, make sure that you can maximize that moment where in-app purchases can be maximized without overstimulating the user. And the same things work on the ad monetization side as well. 
And I think we have reached a stage in the industry where that art and science is kind of going hand in hand, uh, more, more than what we have seen in the last you know, 12 to 8, I mean, uh, compared to one or two years back. So, and this is something that we keep repeating, yin and yang, and you know, it's, it's probably the best way to look at this problem about monetization. And uh, that's, that's what I had to share. Thank you, Jayesh. Now, I think we have time probably just for one question now, if anyone in the audience has one. If not, I've definitely got one. Um, so, I mean, you've, you represent quite a broad part of the world, I would say, for Immobi, and you've been particularly focused in this part of the world. You've been Pan and Korea and so on. I mean, do these principles apply equally to the world in general? I mean, we've talked a lot today about e companies in the east heading west and vice versa. I mean, can, can we just apply these to all games and all, all gamers, more, more importantly? So, there is this other, uh, you know, finding by some other, uh, some of the scientists, right? So there is a 10,000 hour rule, right? So something that you do for 10,000 hours, you get more and more evolved at it and you get, so I think some of the uh, core gaming markets like Japan and Korea, they have already very evolved, right? So, so the principles remain the same, but the way you design uh, needs more sophistication, right? Because they've already gone through a period of evolution, whereas uh, Southeast Asia, you may have to do a lot more hand-holding, uh, and that's what you know. You know, the, uh, the, the presentation by Game will show that you're trying to handhold more, whereas in more evolved markets like Japan and Korea, you're probably trying to, you know, design it in such a way that you don't have to do handholding. And different things come into play. So, Japan is the only market where you need to have a dedicated customer service team to service your gaming customers. You have to treat them, you know, like you know royalty. So. So that's how evolved that market is. So I think uh, it's a scale difference, but principle-wise, it's probably the, the same. Well, I mean, this is all very important stuff. Game design is increasingly, as you say, about science as, it, as much as it is about art, particularly on, on the mobile side. Um, well, thank you very much. Another round of applause for Jayesh. Thank you.